Good evening. This is uh, the fifth lecture for um, chapter six, and this is our last one for chapter six. So we are going to be uh, talking about political participation. Now we know that looking at a variety of um, a variety of factors have changed the composition of who's uh, able to vote. Um, we know that early on, considering the fact that property rights were a great deal for the founders, um, it was therefore one of the elements that kept people from voting. But by, by 1830, uh, virtually all property rights had been eliminated. Uh, by 1870, uh, racial um, discrimination, at least as far as voting goes, was ended by the 15th Amendment. Um, of course, the caveat to that is the, is the situation uh, in the South. Um, this wasn't necessarily true of the rest of the states, but certainly in the old states of the Confederacy because of Jim Crow, uh, that necessitated the passage of the Civil Rights Act, and in particular, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, in 1919, they passed the 19th Amendment, so by 1920, there was the elimination of sexual discrimination. And then we jump all the way to 1964, and we see the elimination of poll taxes. And um, poll taxes were eliminated by, uh, by the uh, uh, 24th Amendment to the Constitution. And then you have following uh, on that, the elimination of literary tests in 1965, which was uh, invalidated by the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Then you have the partial elimination of state registration laws, which also occur uh, in, by, because of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You then jump six years later to a reduction of the voting age to 18 years old with the passage of the 26th Amendment. And you have uh, a potential further elimination of state registration uh, in the Motor Voter Act of 1993, which after being a reader this year, um, many people, uh, many students, uh, interpreted the combination of the Motor Voter Act and registration incorrectly, um, assuming that you needed to get a driver's license in order to uh, vote, and that, necess that wasn't the focus of the law at all. The law was simply to make it easier for people to register and then therefore be ready for um, the act of voting on uh, election day because you've already re you've already registered. Uh, incredibly enough, um, there were many kids who felt who, who, who wrote that if you didn't own a car, you therefore couldn't register to vote and therefore couldn't vote. It's, it's amazing the misinformation that, that, that gets built up. Um, then there was the, the reduction of residency requirement to one or two months. In, in California, basically about two weeks before the election, uh, there was a small window where uh, you could no longer register to vote. Um, and basically in California, you got, you've got to be uh, living here a month. Or in some other states now, uh, you could literally move in <coughs> on election day and register to vote. Um, and then maybe move somewhere else after that. Now, the one thing that I didn't touch upon was the very first thing to go, and actually that was the, um, the elimination of uh, any sort of um, any sort of religion or following any sort of religion. That was actually the first thing to go, and it was eliminated by the state legislatures in the 1790s. Most people don't assume that we had we ever had any of those that would block people from voting, but it uh, was something that. That existed. So that leaves us with four things before we get to um, before we get to this voter turnout. Um, there's there's basically four historical qualifications for suffrage. One is citizenship, which is stated in the Constitution. One is residency. Remember, you have to be a resident of a state that you vote in, just like you have to be a resident of a state that um, that you run in for office. The third is age, which is now, of course, 18. And the fourth is registration, which is 
basically true of all states with the exception of North Dakota. Now that leads us into looking at this, and this is one of the reasons uh, 2008 and 2012, the number of registered voters um, was not exactly known, was the fact that North, North Dakota uh, and a couple of other states now, which offer same-day registration, meant that we didn't, or they didn't know exactly what the uh, exact registration is for that. So when we look at voter turnout, we know that uh, a minority of Americans choose the leadership, and that's not really a uh, not really a surprise. So you know that in uh, U.S. presidential elections, about 50% of the of the population turns out. In uh, midterm congressional elections, it's 30 to 40 percent, based on the lower end. If there's not even a Senate contest. Uh, the higher end if there's a Senate and a gubernatorial contest. Uh, it's even lower in state and local elections. And voter turnout generally has been in decline since 1960. Now, in comparison to other countries, the, uh, uh, the industrialized nations of the West have a much higher turnout. Um, sometimes it's as high as 90%, but there's a caveat to that. Because number one, the U.S. does not impose any penalties on voter turnout for, or for not voting. Um, so there's no government fines, there's no government paperwork that's stamped, uh, did not vote. Other nations do do that. Um, this would probably be uh, unconstitutional here in the United States. Um, other nations have multi-party systems that allow for more choice and therefore more people show up. Um, but we also see this, this decline happening in European countries and in Asian countries which have multi-party systems. Um, other nations have, and states like Minnesota, have automatic same-day registration voting. Um, and that is, I, I think, an advantage because many people in their busy lives do forget to, to register. And in places like, uh, let's take a look at Australia, um, the Aussies have a system in which you have to show up at the poll. You don't have to vote. But their thought is, if you show up at the poll, then you'll go ahead. You've, you're already 90% complete. You just go ahead and vote. Uh, and so they have uh, a rather uh, high turnout, like some of the European countries do. And so we have to ask ourselves, why do we have a, a low voter turnout? And one of the one of the big reasons is um, I'm going to go to this next, and we can. This is just a graph here. Um, I don't want to go through that. And it's probably something I should have included in uh, in as another slide. But there's some institutional barriers that uh, that Americans face that don't let them vote. Number one, and the biggest. One is registration. Um, if we eased or, or we eliminated registration, it would add about 9% to the turnout. The National Registration Act of 1993, which is also known as the Motor Voter Act, was designed to increase voter turnout um, because, number one, it allows people to register when renewing a license or registering a car. Um, it requires that various government offices offer registration forms. The government offers it now on, and state governments offer it on the net. I register, I re-registered because I moved uh, at the Secretary of State site. I also helped a couple of Highland students um, register to vote because they didn't know where to go. Um, it requires the states to allow registration by mail so you can pick up a registration form in the post office and mail it in. And some states, as we see this time, I think there's 32 states that are um, using early voting. California is not one of them, but uh, many eastern, some western, and some southern states um, have been voting for a week, week and a half. Colorado is the state farthest west that I know of that allows early voting. Uh, Colorado, though, is also an all mail-in vote election, as is Oregon. They don't have any precincts anymore. California does, but California is at the point, there's a tipping point in California where the number of absentee ballots 
are exceeding the number of people who show up at the polls. Um, the thing about the Motor Voter Act, though, is that it has not um, increased election turnout very much. It, it has made registration easier, but it doesn't mean that people turn out. So that, if we're looking at turnout, that, again, we have to look at the elections themselves or what what the elections are about. Now this year, if you're a California voter, you're not faced with a, a abnormally long ballot. In 2012, you were faced with an abnormally long ballot. This year, the ballot is lengthy, despite the fact that there are only, um, I think, five or six ballot issues, because I think virtually every um, Supreme Court justice on the Supreme Court is up for a yes or no vote. And it's very, very difficult to find any information on those judges, those Supreme Court judges, California Supreme Court judges. Um, I think they're up for 12-year terms, and so we say yes or no uh, every uh, 12 years. But that, that excessively long ballot can be um, a put-off for voters. They get their sample ballot, and they go, oh, man, I don't even know how to vote, who to vote for, what to vote on, and I'm just going to you know, toss it in the in the in the trash and it'll be taken out with the garbage or the rest of the garbage and so you know that's it's it's that long ballot that turns some people off we know that general elections if we look back at a previous slide general elections um the turnout is greater than state elections chief executive election turnout presidential elections um are much the turnout is much higher than in legislative election turnout. Presidential elections have the highest turnout. National election turnout trumps state election turnout. If there's no national election, the numbers, the turnout in states is lower than it normally would be. For we used to we used to consider this as an absolute. There used to be a problem with uh, obtaining absentee ballots, um, and we also have too many elections. We will vote twice this year. We voted in June. We will vote now. We will vote next year for off-year elections. Um, there is a school board election locally next year, probably water board. Um, and then 2016, the presidential primaries, uh, the national election. It seems like it's never-ending. We're in places like Britain, you might vote every four or five years. And of course, Young people tend to vote the least. They have the lowest turnout. Uh, when the 26th Amendment was ratified, turnout naturally declined. It might have added you know, 10 million new voters, but when only 15% of them vote, the, the percentage turnout will uh, decline. So let's look at, uh, we can see here the election turnout from 1980 to 2008. Um, we can see the mean has uh, has increased slightly increasing for the presidential election turnout in 2008, uh, then it lowered in 2012. But we can see that it's very difficult to get to uh, um, it's very difficult to get to the 1940-1950 uh, range of turnout. And then we can also see in comparison to the elect the presidential election year turnouts, which are in green, the um, the blue bars turnout, which represents midterm elections, which are, are rather low. So, who votes? Well, it's interesting because um, the voter profiles, when you look at them, um, it's a, a voter pro profile, which, which, and I need to explain all of these. Uh, if we look at the average vote, well, the easy one is the middle-aged or older voter will vote uh, more than anyone else. Um, that's a truism that we cannot uh, we cannot deny. It. Every election, it is like this. We know that um, the record for 18 to 24-year-olds is really, really poor. Then the next group that is most likely to vote are whites. 
followed by blacks, followed by Hispanics, followed by Asians. But there's some caveats to this. Um, when we factor in things like socioeconomic levels, black voters actually turn out in higher numbers than white voters, and especially in, in that's true in local elections. But usually white, black, Hispanic, and then Asian. The third factor is the higher the education one has, the more likely they are to vote. And you're more likely to vote if you're if you live outside the South than if you live inside the South. And you're more likely to vote, though this used to be um, used to be different, you're more likely to vote if you're a female. Females have highly have a, a slightly higher turnout rates than males do. And also, uh, if you're married, you're more likely to get out to vote than if you're single. And I believe um, looking at this election cycle. Um, so, so for instance, married women seem to be leaning GOP, but single women um, uh, are lean Democrat. And Democrats are hoping that many of them turn out uh, on Tuesday, November 4th. Then white collar trumps blue collar. And if you don't have a job, uh, you're, you're the least likely to vote at all. If you live in an area for a long time, you're more likely to vote. If you continue, if you continue to move every one or two years, um, sometimes you forget to register, and then you, therefore you're less likely to vote. And then, when you combine wealth with uh, education, these are the most highly uh, participatory voters. But the the higher up on the on the socioeconomic level you are, uh, the more likely you are to vote. Um, but again, remember, there's a disappearance of, of the racial factor when we consider socioeconomic status. <clears throat> now, the reasons for voting. Well, people feel that there's a duty, an obligation of citizenship to vote. Uh, they, there's a belief from, from many that the, every vote that they, they cast counts. Uh, a very contested election, let's say this year, North Carolina, uh, Colorado, Wisconsin, will bring voters out more so than if it's a one-sided election. For some people, there's a, a joy and a pride in participating. Um, there's also you know, that political efficacy that we look at. Um, there's the desire to influence the outcome of an election or the direction of a country. So if you have external political efficacy, um, you believe that you can you can change or be part of that, that change and um, that kind of political efficacy uh, drove the 2008 uh, election and to somewhat the 2012 election but especially this was true of the 2008 election then of course there are the people who vote by party there's an affinity for uh, for the party or the candidate and then sometimes and this is why um, Democrats were very successful in 2008 2012 was their ability to get voters out, to identify prospective Democratic voters and get them out. Republicans have been playing catch up uh, with this game. And that's, uh, that's definitely true. Now, <clears throat> there's lots of reasons for not voting too. There's a lack of interest. There's a lack of, again, political efficacy, uh, internal and external. There's, a, uh, there's just no faith in the system. It doesn't matter if you vote or not. Uh, there can be a lack of <clears throat> government responsiveness to the individual voter, a feeling of helplessness, uh, a lack of any real choice between the candidates themselves. It, it also, remember that uh, there's 435 seats in the House, and maybe 40 to 50 of them are, uh, are contestable. So that means that 370, 380 districts um, are dominated by one party or the other. If there's, If you don't have a if your party is the minority, why go out and vote? You're going to lose anyways. Um, there's illness on election day that can that can be a factor. Out of district on election day, lack of transportation to the polls, um, fear to register, fear to uh, obtain an absentee ballot. Now this is how the parties have battled, um, especially that illness on election day or out of the district on election day. They have. Uh, it used to be the absentee ballots were rather strictly controlled and you really had to prove that you needed one. And then you had to 
then there was less of an effort to prove that you needed one. And then in the last decade, both parties, in order to get or stimulate turnout or get their people out, have been have been helping people um, who say they need an absentee ballot by sending them an absentee ballot. And many times that absentee ballot, uh, knowing that you're a Democrat or Republican, um, the Secretary of State or the, the county registrar can can know that you've turned your ballot in and they can notify the parties of that this, this many of their voters have, have turned ballots in. Um, we get some sort of sometimes a feel for which way the uh, election is going and we you know we in particular hear that about the uh, the early voting effort uh, in um, in several states um, <clears throat> now when we look at not why you voted or why you didn't vote but this is a, another approach uh, why did you make the decision that you did well, first and foremost, if you're going to vote for, let's say, Jerry Brown or Neil Kashkari here in California, for many people it might be, well, I'm a Democrat, so I'm going to vote for Brown, or I'm a Republican, so I'm going to vote for Kashkari. Um, it can be that many people are, are swayed by uh, Prop 45 or Prop 46 and the arguments from one side or the other, and that gets them to the polls. But they're, you know, with this, with this approach, there could be many voters who turn out um, only to vote on 45 or 46, or in other, like Washington or Colorado in the past, where people turned out to vote only to vote on uh, the marijuana initiatives or something like that. And the problems with this type of voting is that um, there's, a, there's a, a lack of perspective. That, that you need to be concerned with more than one issue, even though that issue may be overriding for you, to be, to be f focused and to be motivated by just one issue uh, creates a problem for the, the, the broad problems and trying to find a solution for those broad problems that we face. So issue voting, um, you know, you've got the... Um, can be a lack of clarity on uh, on the issues or the, on the positions of the candidate. Um, there can be, uh, and this is a hard one. There can be a, an agreement with the um, with the candidate's positions, but not an agreement on how they should implement that that agreement or that position. Um, and then there can be a, a, an agreement with different candidates on different issues, and you're all over the place. That means you're a, a rather pragmatic. Uh, voter. Now, there are a couple different reasons we vote the way that we do. And <coughs> um, when we look at prospective voting, we're looking at what the candidates are telling us. And the candidates have given us positions, they have spoken in certain ways that have, that have meant something to us. Um, there's a number of things that attract us to candidate A or candidate B. And when we look at voting from that position, we are looking at, at being a prospective voter. We're, we're basing our judgment on what they may do in the future. Retrospective voting, though, is, is instead of looking forward, you're looking behind. It's the basis on candidate A has done nothing for me, or candidate A has been great, and I'm going to vote for him or her again. So it's, it's, a, it's a judgment that is based on results, not on intentions. And then there's the there's that intangible in American voting. Um, there's perception of uh, of the candidate themselves. We might consider their past accomplishments. So, for instance, in the current election, Joni Ernst, the, the Senate candidate from Iowa, is talking about her 22 years in the in the military. Uh, and other candidates are doing the same thing. Uh, Tom Cotton in Arkansas. Other places. On the other hand, uh, some of them can talk about um, their accomplishment in uh, in big business, but they get bashed by it from the other side, like David or David Perdue is in Georgia uh, for outsourcing. Um, there's also the perception of competence or political ability, and, and we key in on that. And we do do we think this person is going to make a good senator or a good representative? 
And if we don't think they will, then we're not, gonna, we're not going to vote for them. Or there's the perception of the ability to deal with a crisis or other elected officials or other branches of government. And that, I think, is really what's hurting President Obama in this 2014 um, uh, midterm. Um, there isn't the perception that he's dealing with crises very well or he's dealing with other elected officials very well or he's dealing with Congress very well. So consequently, um, that may turn voters off. They can't vote for the president, so they're not going to vote for his proxy, which is anybody that his party puts up for the Senate or the House or for any local, um, local position. Now, what does the average voter do? Well, for the most part, um, there's very few that do become members of paid political staff. Um, there's a far greater number of people who donate their time as a volunteer for an effort or the party or whatever. Um, the biggest thing, though, that, that um, the concerned voters should focus on is keeping abreast of the issues, um, making, uh, you know, making uh, themselves aware of, of the issues themselves and how a vote yes or how a vote no or how vote for that candidate, or how vote for that, or not that candidate, would um, would work. Now, I'm going to leave it back on this screen just for a second, on that last uh, that last screen, and I want to talk just, I want to wrap up a couple different things. Remember, there's um, political reasons for not voting, the lack of political efficacy, uh, the dissatisfaction with candidates, the dissatisfaction with the parties, uh, politics in general. you just turned off so you don't vote. There's a lack of strong two-party competition in many states or in many congressional districts. And the weaknesses of the parties themselves, though this has improved since I, since I first wrote this, this has very much improved starting in 2008 with the Democrats. Um, and again, the Republicans are playing catch-up. So who votes? Who doesn't? Who cares? Well, again, let's look at, let's review the the predictors. Number one, the level of education achievement is the greatest predictor of voting. Not age, not any, any others, but really the greatest predictor of voting is educational achievement. And when you couple that with high levels of educate with, uh, um, with these high levels of edu education, um, it, that trumps race, that trumps sex, it trumps income status. So if you're uh, a black male who is a professor, if you're a Hispanic female who's a CEO, um, and you both have MBAs, uh, you're going to vote versus someone who works on an assembly line um, or uh, other mundane jobs who, uh, who aren't likely to vote. Then the second factor is income. And those with higher levels of income are more likely to vote. Third is age. The older the voter, except for the very old, um, the more likely they are to vote. 18 to 24 year olds have the lowest uh, voter turnout. And then race. Again, whites are more likely to, to vote than blacks, who are more likely to vote than Hispanics, who are more likely to vote uh, than Asians. Now finally, we have to ask ourselves this. Does low voter turnout matter? If voters accurately represented a cross-section of the United States population, then low turnout would be relatively unimportant. It would be like a random sample of uh, voters when a polling organization calls. Um, the problem is, though, uh, with that assumption, is that older white voters with higher levels of income and educational achievement are overrepresented. And that's probably true. And that means that there's a problem of class bias. And class, we mean by socioeconomic class. But there is a rebuttal to that argument that is also rather strong. Some studies show that although non-voters are demographically different from those who vote, when they're asked, how would you have voted on this issue, they're not politically different from those who did actually vote. They wouldn't have voted significantly different than those who voted. And so therefore, the fact that they're not there doesn't change the outcome of the issue. So that is our wrap-up of 
um, chapter uh, chapter six. Just one more thing, uh, and your book focuses on it a little bit. But gender gap um, again: men vote uh, Republican, women vote Democratic as a, as a uh, as kind of a norm, um, which is why Republicans have fought to uh, undercut the Democrats on the um, on the women issue in the 2014 midterms. And I've done a pretty good job of doing that. Um, it's an issue that's worked for the Democrats in 2008 and in 2012, but not so much uh, this time around. And I think that will just about cover everything. Um, in this, we covered, uh, in earlier lectures, we covered the, uh, uh, the makeup of the election. We did talk about gender gap but I just wanted to repeat it one more time. Okay.